On this episode of China Unscripted, the world is worried that China will attack Taiwan, but could China attack India first? And is India ready? Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesta. Joining us today is Rajiv Dogra, former Indian ambassador to Romania and Italy and the author of the new book, Wartime, The World in Danger. Thanks a lot for joining us today. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Well, so, I mean, right now, everyone is talking about, you know, China and Taiwan, the, the, the threat of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. But you've said that the greater danger is actually on India's border with China. Uh, why is that? Well, uh, you started off on a, on a, on a very tricky uh, question. That's how we do it. That is something which the world should be asking. That uh, is Taiwan really uh, President Xi's focus, or does he have another game plan? In fact, I had been wondering about this for the last few years, especially after one of your former directors of FBI said that USA needs to be much more focused on China, and it does not require just a whole of the nation approach, but whole of the society approach, and this comment of his kept uh, ringing in my ears as to why did he see the, say that? And if distant America can be so bothered, what about places which are next to China? Places like India. Uh, is India equally uh, aware of China's plans? Uh, and is America and the rest of the world also conscious of the fact that China may have greater plans in the years ahead than the world is uh, apprehensive about. So these are the things which set me off on writing this book. And I feel that Taiwan is very much an issue that uh, China wishes to tackle. But according to Taiwanese themselves, it may not happen for the next three years. Whereas American uh, experts feel it may not happen over the next six years. These, of course, uh, are just uh, guesstimates or estimates and they, they may change uh, as in the case of Ukraine. No one imagined that it would happen the way it happened in a matter of weeks or days. So uh, the, the, these things are uh, to be speculated about. It is necessary because it makes you conscious of what could possibly happen. And in that sense, I felt that it will be easier for friends, allies, partners of Taiwan to come to its aid uh, than it might be for, uh, let's say, a friend like America to come to India's aid purely for physical reasons, because the fighting, if at all it takes place, would take place at the heights of 16 to 17,000 feet, which translates to about five to 6,000 meters. And just to acclimatize uh, the soldiers from another country or another place uh, would take days uh, altogether. And to send the equipment to those heights will not be easy, whereas China has approaches right up to the line of actual control. So it is stationed there with all its heavy equipment, with all its air force, and with all its artillery and men, of course. So. Uh, from the Chinese perspective, uh, to come back to your original question, uh, what is the message it wants to send to the world? The big message it would like to send to the world is that it is now equal, if not better than America. And the only way it can do that is to take on another country which it feels is in its way of becoming the sole superpower of Asia. So uh, let me let me uh, stop there because there will be follow-up questions which uh, you would certainly have. But this is basically the line on which I had pursued this issue and I would maintain that what I finally wrote in the book is sort of what may actually bear me out. 
That's a very interesting point because in the case of Taiwan, like, you know, the U.S. has Guam stationed in uh, Japan and Okinawa. There's Australia right there. It, there's access by, you know, potential allies of Taiwan. But yeah, the, the India-China border, that's way up in the Himalayas. There's, that would be difficult for any other country to get there in the event of fighting, whereas China already has its troops right there, already acclimatized to that kind of climate, and really, as we've seen, ready to go. They have been salami slicing the Indian border, trying to take over land, not just in India, but also down in Bhutan, trying to surround India. So do you think what might happen is that while, you know, everyone's kind of focused on Taiwan in this, you know, say it's like six years away from an invasion of Taiwan, in that in the meantime, they will try to get invade the Indian border? Well, quite frankly, I hope it does not happen. Because any fight between two big countries is not just going to affect those two countries, but also the wider world. Because both India and China have uh, supply uh, responsibilities to countries in far distant uh, parts of the globe. For example, India uh, had supplied COVID vaccine to over 100 countries uh, when it was desperately needed. Similarly, now when food supplies were running short because of the situation in Ukraine, India had to step in again and it stepped in gladly. So any war that happens uh, or uh, unfortunately happens between two big countries would have uh, an effect much beyond uh, their immediate uh, uh, area of uh, concern. Uh, so that is one thing. The second is the terrain, which you very rightly pointed out. In fact, when I was uh, your age, or probably younger, I had gone exactly to those areas as a part of my diplomatic training. And I can tell you, when I reached just about 15,000 feet, we flew in there, uh, and I tried to, uh, you know, in your enthusiasm as a 26-year-old, try to have a game of table tennis. Uh, within two minutes, I was lying flat on the ground because of the lack of acclimatization, because the oxygen level goes down as you go higher and higher. And the same would apply to superfit troops, uh, whether they are from country X or uh, Y or India. They would need to be acclimatized before they can actually go to the first big height and then on to where the line of actual control is, which is higher still. So uh, it will have to be, uh, unlike in the case of Taiwan, it will have to be a, a lone uh, battle, at least in the initial stages, unless China, for some reason, decides to give a uh, warning of, let's say, a month or two that, yes, I'm going to attack. But those happen not even in novels or fiction books. Uh, in reality, they are mostly surprises. So I guess the question I have is, like, it, it's very clear what China's interests in Taiwan is. It's part of party propaganda about, you know, national rejuvenation. It's a very strategic location, access to the South China Sea, being able to project power out of the first and second island chain, uh, semiconductors. What's China's interest in the border with India. I mean, it's, as we've said, it's, it's the Himalayas, it's high, it's, it's a difficult, harsh environment. What is their goal there? Especially considering, as you mentioned, the risk of getting into a major conflict with a major power like India, it's dangerous. Well, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, why, why fight for a place which is desolate, which is like a desert at 16 or 17,000 feet? Uh, this is a question China needs to ask itself. But China has strategic interests, uh, which it feels uh, it must uh, fulfill uh, by getting uh, territory which is Indian. And if you look at the map of India, and if you start from, uh, you know, if India is facing you on a map, and if you start from the extreme right portion, which we call the Northeast, uh, the Arunachal Pradesh, China calls it the lower Tibet. Uh, and it feels that it must also conquer Arunachal Pradesh because otherwise Dalai Lama and his followers will always connect it to the main Tibet and 
say that, look, Tibet does not belong to China. So, one, China wants to remove that impression uh, totally from people's mind, especially Buddhist uh, Tibetans' mind. Secondly, uh, it would have then connection with the entire eastern part of Asia, starting from Myanmar on to Thailand and so on. So there is a strategic, strategic connection to its desire to have a claim and annex, if, if possible, uh, Arunachal Pradesh, that is the northeast. Now we come to the so-called western sector, which is Ladakh, where the fighting took place two years back in June 2020, where 20 Indian soldiers died and about 45 Chinese soldiers died. But China claims only four of its soldiers died because otherwise it would have been a major setback for President Xi in China. So this happened in the Western, uh, the Western sector uh, called Ladakh uh, and specifically Galwan. The reason why that is uh, important for China, I mean, I'm uh, putting these words as if uh, some Chinese spokesperson was speaking, uh, that his desire is to annex this because it will connect him to the Pakistan's occupied Kashmir, uh, the heights there. And it will also deny access to India uh, to Aksai Chin, uh, which, which was a territory that China had captured in 1962 when we had a major war. And this is about 38,000 square kilometers. And if India gets back that Aksai Chin area, uh, which uh, borders uh, Ladakh, then China has difficulty in reaching places like Xinjiang in its territory. So, let me explain it again that Aksai chain belonged to India, which was annexed by China in 1962. And having got Aksai chain, it wants to get more of the Indian territory in Ladakh so that it can have connection with Pakistan in the Kashmir that Pakistan has occupied in 1947. So it is a desire to expand China's uh, hold over an area uh, which, which may sound uh, as inhospitable in terms of human habitation, but is extremely important uh, in terms of strategic implication and also in terms of its mineral resources and some of the biggest rivers in the world flow from that area. So it has control over water, uh, which is going to be more and more uh, important in future and mineral resources, which some of them are rare. So if this war, this potential war that would happen between China and India over like this border region, these disputed territories, like you mentioned, some of these territories have been disputed for decades. Do you think that other countries like the U.S. would get involved in this or would they be more likely to see it as like just a border dispute issue? Well, uh, look at the recent example uh, of what is happening in Ukraine. Uh, whether the rest of the world is involved physically in it or not, the fact is that a number of countries uh, are out there helping Ukraine in a variety of ways. So uh, who is helping Russia? Uh, no one has come forward openly, but there are claims that you know China is sympathetic to Russia or Iran is supplying some drones. So the warfare today is much more complex than it was, let's say, five years back or 10 years back and requires uh, inputs in a variety of ways. For example, uh, intelligence need not be persons on the ground. Uh, they are also necessary, but it can be eyes in the sky, the satellites. Uh, it can be uh, radio uh, eavesdropping. It can be electronic signals, and it can be supply of armaments. For example, some of the missiles being supplied by America and Ukraine are uh, having a deadly effect. Uh, the artillery duels that uh, Ukraine is fighting now, and there's a counter from Russia, 
would not have been so effective had other countries not supplied them to Ukraine. So any war, especially a war which assumes a certain uh, significance or, or danger level, uh, cannot be a, a, a single country operation any longer. Uh, second thing is, uh, Ukraine-Russia, of course, is one example, but it is an example uh, which is more or less in isolation, that it is a fight between these two and the others are concerned. Uh, but that does not stop there, because as I mentioned earlier, uh, Ukraine's wheat supply is uh, upsetting uh, the routine and the lives and the livelihood of many countries and many people in the world. Now, expand it to a major level, uh, let's say in case of uh, Taiwan-China uh, conflict or India-China conflict, the effects would be humongous because uh, what will happen between them is not just fighting between soldiers or fighting in terms of equipment or fighting in terms of cyber war warfare, let's say. China is aiming to change the world order as it has existed since 1945. You see, after 1945, a new world order was, was devised and which had worked very well till now uh, in terms of uh, how human rights should be viewed by the world, how sovereign states are equal in every respect, how uh, disputes should be solved, how UN should act uh, as, a, as a peacekeeper, uh, how uh, legal issues between countries should be uh, handled in the Hague. So there was a, and of course, not to forget about the financial mechanisms, uh, IMF, World Bank, and so on. So there was a whole chain uh, of institutions which had been established and which were called the New World Order and which had served the world very well in terms of human dignity, in terms of human interaction, in terms of national interaction. Now, China wants to have a new world order to its design. And that is why there are two countries that are standing in its way. One is US, uh, because it is the most powerful uh, country as of now. And second is India, which is the largest democracy in the world. So China feels that these two countries are the threat to its global domination. So what is at stake uh, is, is really uh, China's desire to become the capo del capo, capo of the world. Well, so if China's goal is to create this new world order, don't you think that doing something like invading Taiwan or invading India would actually hurt them? Wouldn't that make the rest of the world like say, hey, this is an aggressive state. We can't let them have that kind of power. Uh, the war for Ukraine definitely hurt Putin and Russia's standing in the world with a lot of countries. Wouldn't the same happen to China? Absolutely. Uh, you are asking this question. I wish more people in the world would be asking this question, that uh, uh, what does China gain by uh, invading Taiwan or having a war with India or some other country? I've already uh, mentioned uh, what is China's ambition and oh, what does it uh, uh, wish to do once uh, it has the capability of ordering a new uh, global system. So, whether that desire ultimately uh, comes about is, is uh, yet to be seen. But to give you an example of how rash China can be, uh, let me take you back to 1945. Europe was devastated. Uh, Europe was in ruins uh, from Germany to France to England to, you know, wherever you went. Uh, there, were, there was rubble all around, uh, which happens when you have a, a huge... Uh, war like the World War II. So what did America do? America introduced the Marshall Plan. America did not impose punitive interest rates on Germany or France that you should give me back the money uh, once, once you have your building ready or industry ready. Uh, Marshall Plan was a gift uh, to Europe at a time when it needed succor, it needed uh, 
help it needed solved on its wounds with the war wounds and it worked beautifully europe was rejuvenated in comparison what is china doing see the condition of sri lanka the punitive interest rates that china has imposed are single handedly responsible for the ruin that china, uh, sri lanka has become the financial ruin that it has become and that is finding it extremely difficult to dig itself out of that huge hole similarly the other countries which were given you know chinese yuan or whatever currency it was for bri that hugely expensive uh, infrastructure project are now finding it difficult to pay back that money because that is a transportation project meant for china's strategic interests for china's overlordship it cannot have any economic value unless there is supporting industry along with that in- infrastructure project and there is virtually zero industry so how do they these poor countries or these countries pay china back they are finding it extremely difficult if not impossible to do that the second thing is look at europe also there is a railway line which china has built from china to europe to the other end of europe uh thinking that it will transport goods there uh as an alternative to the sea route once that railway line was built what did the europeans find that over a four month period only 300 million dollars worth of goods were transported on that railway line whereas one of the four chinese major ports handles 300 million dollars of goods every four hours so what is the point of having that railway line when sea route is so much cheaper and so much more convenient so china does not think in terms of the american generosity of marshall plan or in terms of the recipients uh, it only thinks of what suits its interests best and in terms of the infrastructure that it was building in terms of roads and so on uh it was employing largely its own companies so money was going from one chinese hand to the other chinese hand and in between the states concerned were left with the huge debt so chinese ambitions chinese desires chinese uh, motivations need to be examined at every turn since you bring this up you know you were um ambassador to romania and to italy what how have those two countries fared with respect to china's belt and road investments well uh, romania is still safe but uh, italy and greece uh, are uh, uh, you know uh, i wouldn't say in chinese grip but uh, china has quite quite a hold over greece in terms of most of its ports china has a lot of hold in terms of uh, italian some of the italian industries especially small and medium uh, if for example you must have heard of the murano island near venice if you go to murano the shopkeepers there will tell you that we don't produce any bit of murano glass everything is manufactured in china uh, if you go to prato which used to be the textile town of italy uh, and that is where uh, covid spread uh, from the chinese colony there into europe uh if you go to prato you would find entire streets and shopping uh, areas full of uh, chinese nationals they take one uh, shop and then overnight i mean over the course of the next few months and years you find the entire street has been emptied out of italians and chinese are overtaken so china has not a hold over the government of italy or uh, the government of romania but in italy certainly it has a presence and it is a visible presence the second thing to answer your question in a, uh, another way and another example is that some countries in europe members of eu like hungary will not allow any anti china uh, bill to be passed in the european parliament or by european union uh, so china's hold over some countries in europe Uh, especially some of the former east european countries who are members of eu now is remarkable 
and uh, it is affecting the policies of those countries. Well, I'm glad you brought up uh, some of the, the the economic leverage China uses around the world, because you've also said that uh, you know China isn't just using military action against India on the border. What are some of the uh, non-military strategies China is using uh, to compete with India? China has been very selective in its approach, and it picks one sector, concentrates on it, ensures that that sector is virtually decimated in terms of local production. Uh, to give you an example, it started in a very small way by capturing the toy manufacturing market of India. And in a period of a uh, couple of years, we found that all the toys uh, are being um, uh, exported by China into India. And Indian toy industry had been virtually reduced to nothing. To give you another extreme example, the religious gods, the icons of the Hindu gods, were traditionally made in India for centuries, for thousands of years. Suddenly we found that uh, come a religious festival and at the back of the icon was written made in China. So China went about in a very systematic way and then it went into bigger areas. So as uh, not to be noticed that it is aiming for something specific. The first area was the power sector of India. Suddenly we found that all our major industries had been wiped out because Chinese pricing was much better. Uh, it was much better because the state was sponsoring those industries in China. State was subsidizing them so that they could outprice the Indian counterparts. And Except for one major state sector industry in India, we found that the rest were out of competition. So power sector, which was being supplied by, you know, less than uh, perfect uh, equipment from China, uh, suddenly became uh, beholden to China. Then they went on to the telecommunication sector. Now both power and telecommunication sector are strategic sectors for any country. We found ourselves in a position where we were really uh, dependent on China in these two sectors. Now, of course, corrective measures are being taken, but this is after uh, some damage had been done and some serious concern uh, was there for people to see. The other thing is that uh, it is not just India which is being affected by, by, by Chinese uh, uh, practices. Look at the world itself. I mean, who made China the superpower that it has become? It was Nixon and Kissinger combined. When they went there in 1972, I mean, first Kissinger went and then Kissinger and Nixon. They decided that Soviet Union had to be uh, countered via China, which was a wrong policy. And then America kept on helping China. The second big stage was in the year 2001 when the world decided that China can become the member of WTO. At that time, the Chinese economy was of $1 trillion. Within 20 years, by 2020, it had become a $15 trillion economy. Largely, experts say, because of its admission into WTO and it could then take advantage of the democratic world and its free trade practices. So we, the people of the world, are equally responsible in making China the monster it has become. That's true. That's definitely true. I don't know. I think America should get a, an you know extra credit for that. Yeah. We, we really, we really did a lot. Well, for yeah. China. I mean, if it weren't for like the American tech sector, just going head over heels for China. Well, and the financial sector. Well, but so, I'm, I'm going somewhere specific with this. Like then, like if they hadn't, if the tech sector hadn't gone there, Huawei wouldn't have been, become what it is. And then China wouldn't be taking over the telecommunications industry of like India or all over Africa. Like if, if it weren't for that, we wouldn't have given, we gave China the tools it needs to subvert countries around the world without military force. Oh, like how Cisco went into China in like the 90s and then- Built the firewall. Built the firewall and then China took that technology 
and, you know, reused it with their own homegrown companies. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that, by the way. No, no, no. What surprises me, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned this because it triggered a reaction. You know, if you, if you look back in uh, time and go back to 50s and 60s, there was a Soviet phobia. There, there was a fear of communism in America and there's some amount of witch hunt also. But at least it saved America, Americans and the democratic world from being overtaken, let's say, by the uh, Iron Curtain or the communist world. I find it strange that China is pinching you in America and uh, other parts of the world, and yet no one complains. If China says Disney shall not produce a picture which depicts China in the wrong way, Disney says, yes, sir, we will not do that. If China tells a basketball star you are not allowed to enter China because you said something against China, the basketball star immediately apologizes. Why is America, I mean, by America, I mean the democratic world also, it's not just America, so sort of uh, equivalent to Chinese perfidy in terms of the stealing of technology that you mentioned. I have not heard of any punitive action by America against a major Chinese company because it has stolen your rocket technology or missile technology or, uh, uh, you know, uh, submarine technology or the latest fi fighter technology. The same thing is duplicated elsewhere. Australia is doing the same. Australian politics are being uh, influenced by China in a most uh, amazing way. And yet Australia feels that China is its uh, special friend. So why is it that there was one standard for Soviet Union, uh, which had done, you know, nothing in comparison, which was uh, uh, negative to the democratic world, uh, and China gets away virtually with murder? I, I think it's a great question, because like in the 40s and 50s, Americans wouldn't see a movie if one of the actors was a communist to the extent that Hollywood studios were blacklisting people because they knew they couldn't make money if there was a communist in their films. And today, you have Hollywood studios desperately trying to get a Chinese communist company to to finance their movies. Well, I mean, I think there's two things. One is that China has a lot more money than the Soviet Union ever did. That That's a big mistake that the Soviet Union made is essentially wrecking their economy with communism. Uh -huh. uh, and the second thing is that I don't think we have this awareness that there is this kind of Cold War going on between China and the rest of the well, world. Well, you're saying yeah. there's a Cold War. Don't you have a Cold War mentality, yeah, yeah, Shelley? exactly. Well, I don't even think that um, that works maybe for the Chinese foreign ministry to accuse U.S. politicians of, but I don't even think that a lot of, you know, kind of ordinary people would even know about that Cold War mentality thing or they're just, just not aware. Yeah, if there's, you said yeah. that like communists are funding movies in America today, I don't think people would be like, wait, what? That's happening? Yeah. And I think there's the third thing maybe is that people don't think that China is communist anymore. Yeah. Something. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, uh, you're right there. Uh, but let me add to what you said. Uh, again, in form of a question, in form of thinking aloud, the Gulf countries had huge amounts of money. When the oil boom started in the 70s, they didn't know what to do with the money. I mean, they were drowning in tons of dollars that they got. But they did not influence American policies or Western policies or democratic world's policies in the way China has done. You could still have movies which made, uh, you know, uh, uh, critical comments, let's say, about Saudi Arabia or Dubai or whatever, uh, and get away with it. Uh, the other question is, China, it's not a one-way traffic that China prints dollars and gives it to some Americans. No. China gains much more by exporting to America. China gains much more because of American or free world's investments in uh, China. China gains a lot by 
Taiwanese investments in uh, China. There are 100,000 Taiwanese companies and uh, individuals who are right now positioned there in China. So the China's stakes in having a normal relationship with the rest of the world is almost as much, if not greater, than the rest of the world's stake in China. But the big difference is that China uses its stick selectively. China chooses its victims, then gets after them. And no one stands by those victims. The second thing is that Iron uh, Curtain countries were, of course, uh, behind the Iron Curtain, so people didn't know much about them. But still, the world had some idea about them. In China, China's case, we have a total blank slate. We know very little about what is happening inside China. We know very little about their strategic plans. We are guessing. To give you another example, U.S. Department of Defense publishes every year a report on China and its intentions. Uh, on most uh, previous occasions, the focus was on Taiwan besides other things. But India and its uh, Ladakh uh, and line of actual control was not mentioned at all till 2021 and that too in passing. So can you imagine how little we know about China, how little the democratic world knows about China. And that is one of the reasons why we do not have an effective counter when it strikes, let's say, Disney or McDonald's or whatever, or some basketball star, uh, because we, we, we have found looking, uh, you know, askings as to why did it happen. By the time we find an uh, answer or approximate answer, the effect is already there. The fellow has apologized. Well, so actually this, I'm glad you brought this up because this is sort of the flip side of everything that you mentioned how much China does rely on the rest of the world. Um, so, t t I mean, it's disorganized, but to me that means the world has a lot of leverage over China and the Chinese Communist Party. What does the world need to do to prevent China, the Chinese Communist Party, from creating this international, this new world order they want to create? What, what they say in their you know, internal speeches is spreading international communism. Well, uh, that's a big question. Uh, let me uh, take the example of uh, Speaker uh, Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. The entire focus was whether she'll come back safe and sound. Uh, but there were hints that were floating in the air. China said it will have those uh, naval exercises. But the timing was interesting. No one noticed that. The naval exercises were due to start only after Mrs. Pelosi had left Taiwan. So China was giving a hint that we are not going to touch her. Unless you have knowledge about the other person, you will never be able to have an effective counter about it. Look at the number of Chinese students in American universities, European universities, Australian and so on. They go selectively to the most advanced scientific and technological subjects in premier institutions and having sucked out all the knowledge, they go back. Is a comparative advantage there for uh, a young boy from New York or uh, London or Frankfurt? They will not be allowed admission in the top Chinese universities. So why can't there be some reciprocation? I'll come back to what uh, your former director of FBI said, that it has to be a whole of society uh, reaction to China. Uh, the society is not aware, you know, except in your shopping malls where entire sections uh, are full of Chinese goods. Uh, and because they are cheap, everyone wants to pick those uh, things. So society is not aware of China as a threat, except that it is useful to get its goods because they are cheaper. So unless there's an entire awareness Again, I'm coming back to 
the 40s, 50s and 60s of China's intentions that they are hurtful, not just to the society, but the way of its life as it had developed from 1945, we will not be able to face China or face its ambitions or have a counter to its ambitions. And let me uh, elaborate a little bit. Mao uh, had expanded China's territory by 100% during the period that he was there. Uh, Mao in 1957 had gone to a communist gathering in Moscow. And there, in course of his speech, he said, China is not afraid of an atomic bomb. So what if 300 people, million people get killed? We will get to work and start producing more children. Khrushchev, who was there, was aghast. He was aghast because he said this man has so little value for human life. And then, if you go further ahead in China's uh, age, there was a huge drought in China, which killed, there are estimates only, between 30 to 50 million people. Then during Cultural Revolution later, another 25 or 30 million people were killed. Had it happened in any country in the world, even in the Soviet Union of those times, there would have been a massive uproar, scandal, questions, human rights issues and so on. But in the case of China, there was nothing. Or to take the recent example, Wuhan was locked up for maybe two months and then Shanghai. You might say that is their internal affair. No, that is not their internal affair. Because Wuhan was a message that the disease started from there. And Shanghai, when they locked it down for two months, it meant that export-import to the rest of the world, which was vital, uh, was stopped. There were ships lined up, but China couldn't care. So the message in all this is that you are facing a regime, uh, whether it is Mao or uh, Xi now, who are brutal in their approach, who are ruthless in terms of their methods. And if it means going to war, if it means starving the rest of the world, if it means uh, making uh, countries like Sri Lanka uh, cry for every cent uh, that they owe to the world, so what? These things happen. Like one of your defense secretaries said, probably uh, the Chinese leadership would repeat the same thing. Stuff happens. So what if people get killed? So when, you know, you talk about how India could be on the verge of war with China, what happens when India, a democratic country that does value human life, faces off against a regime that does not at all value human life you know, the, the warfare is asymmetrical by its very nature, right? So what is India's plan for handling war with China? Well, uh, firstly, I will not say that India is on the verge of a war with China. Let's hope it never happens. Uh, but, you know, when you accumulate gunpowder, as China has done, all it needs is a careless strike of a matchstick. And China is not very careful when it comes to its ambition. Uh, it, it would uh, go on like a bulldozer. So in case a war unfortunately happens, uh, then India is not going to be a pushover. Let's be very clear on that. Uh, India has a well-deserved reputation for a very professional army and uh, supported by all that technology can possibly give, whether in terms of Air Force, Navy, or the land forces. So uh, it's, it's going to be a tough battle, uh, and China will discover uh, that uh, uh, Indian soldiers uh, will give them back uh, in equal measure, if not more, if not uh, in greater measure, as they discovered in Galwan. Let me also give you uh, uh, an example of the Galwan fighting. You see, when Indian soldiers, uh, whether it was uh, in a war with Pakistan or with China, uh, find a Chinese 
wounded soldier or uh, uh, you know in a serious condition they would give him the at least the first aid treatment if not a, a full treatment if a doctor is nearby they would give him as uh, professional care as possible and then return him to the uh, chinese uh, people there was a paramedic who was also at the scene of fighting in uh, 2020 in galwan so he was taking care of the wounded indian soldiers and then suddenly he saw that there were some chinese soldiers who had been injured by indian soldiers so he started taking care of them meanwhile the fighting had stopped indian soldiers had withdrawn and chinese were withdrawing but chinese thought this paramedic is needed because they had more wounded soldiers at the back so they took him with them made sure that he uh, offered the necessary treatment to the wounded soldiers once he had done his job he was killed by the chinese so this is the kind of state and the system that you are dealing with uh the reason why i elaborated in this on this is because it runs right from the top downwards that mentality of that cruel streak uh is is transposed all the way down uh so if a war happens it will be bloody it will be uh, difficult but uh, uh let, the best thing is to hope that it does not happen What do you think of India's general strategic plan in terms of dealing with China as, you know, a competitor as um somebody who's like an, another like very populous powerful country in Asia? Um do you think that the Indian government has a good plan w- for dealing with China? Not necessarily military, also just, you know, how to deal with the economic competition, things like that. yes uh you know trade wise the, the we in economic uh, dealings let's start with trade trade wise china exports 100 billion dollars every year to india so that is quite significant it's not a small amount india uh, does not export as much it exports just about 30 billion dollars so uh it is not as if uh exports uh, by india if it were to stop tomorrow it will have a huge Im- impact on its economy no it will not uh china uh, may find that uh, exporting to india if it were to stop will affect it in many ways because once you export to a country like india then the message goes many multinationals use it as a, t- a testing ground that if a product like the cup uh, you're drinking from uh, gets accepted in india it will also get accepted let's say in brazil or south africa uh, that's the general standard uh, of trading uh, employed by multinationals so uh, china would find that if it loses this market then its market for mobile phones for example will get affected in other countries also because south korea may take over or an american uh, export house might take over and that will become an endorsement for those products so economically china stands to lose more uh, than india if the relations there were to snap but it is not india's intention to have any break in the trading relations in fact we would much rather that they grow so that understanding grows at various levels diplomacy is another uh, method by which you try to calm down things and that is an ongoing process and uh, hopefully it will have some positive uh, result uh, when uh, that result is needed desperately so uh, to bring down the temperatures so you would mention how uh, if india reduces a certain type of trade with china that has a spillover effect Over the last few years the the India has largely eliminated the sale of Huawei phones inside China. Or sorry, inside India. 
Uh, so has there been a spillover effect from that particular uh, change in trade? Well, uh, that has happened recently. But to give you another example, for ex uh, after 2020, India banned TikTok. Uh, there was an effect in other countries also. Uh, some other countries, including America, started looking more closely at TikTok's operations in America. Uh, Huawei, uh, it is a recent decision, and certainly it is going to have an effect. Uh, <laughs> Give you another example. Uh, Sri Lanka is in such a miserable economic position that I'm sure even they would not be importing much from Huawei any longer. So uh, the, these things have a, a you know run of their own, and uh, they they find their level once uh, uh, people start wondering whether uh, it is in their best interest to import. Uh, equipment from Huawei or some other con country. I mean, I wouldn't be so upset if America banned TikTok, largely because it's stupid, <laughs> uh, but also the massive security risk and tracking all the users. But that, but that hasn't happened. Well, uh, I, I asked you whether we are going to be talking on Zoom, and you very rightly mentioned about this new uh, method, which I had not heard of. But Zoom is Chinese Zoom, and yet most people uh, are now using Zoom at great security risk to themselves and to their uh, industries. Right. Well, that's specifically why we don't use Zoom. Exactly. So you are wise. It kind of goes back to the you know the old days of like Americans wouldn't watch a movie with a communist in it, and now we're like, hey, let's use let's use a TikTok. It's it's you know giving all of our information directly to the communist government. Well, I mean, a, a large corporation using Zoom for corporate meetings could be potentially more dangerous. And it may not be the, yeah. the largest corporations because they have their own internal stuff, but the sort of medium-sized companies or technology startups, yeah, uh, like they, they don't have their own in-house software. So maybe Zoom is just the most convenient. It's the cheapest. But if they knew it was linked to communists. I don't think that they don't, would. They wouldn't no. change their view. No, oh, like, I don't know. But, Chris, but, it's not the 40s. It, it, if it's slightly it can cheaper, be again. it's better. That's what I always say. If it's slightly cheaper, it's probably better. Right? Isn't that how India is viewing well, things? You know, in, in, in terms of uh, uh, purchasing uh, things, equipment and so on, uh, did you mean that? Right. I mean, yeah, I mean, like it's like you talked about how uh, of course, America does this too, right? But in India, you said the the toy industry, right? You get slightly cheaper from China, uh, even the religious icon industry, because it's slightly cheaper to have Ganesh statue made in China than to make it in India. Like, right? I mean, that's been going on for a long time because for most people, most of the time, if it's slightly cheaper, and it's better. You are absolutely right. That's that's the human nature. Uh, so if you can save a dollar, why not? Or if you can save a rupee, why not? But it has larger implications. But to take your question another way, for example, when 2020 the uh, Galwan uh, fighting took place, there were many people uh, who said we will pay an extra rupee or extra dollar, but buy made in elsewhere product, made in India or made in Japan or USA or some other country, but we will not buy a made in China product. Unfortunately, that sentiment lasted only for a few weeks or months. Then again, the same consideration took over. So that is why, uh, uh, this is the third time I'm repeating it, that FBI directors comment that it needs a whole of society of approach. That is very important. Or to give you another example in a, a different way, when I was uh, uh, working on my book, uh, I found that Li Kuan Yu was one of the better informed leaders on China. And a couple of his comments struck me. Uh, for example, he said, America is the greatest military power in, the, in history. Next sentence was, China 
will be the greatest military power the world has ever seen. Now, coming from Lee Kuan Yew, uh, who was a well-regarded Prime Minister of Singapore, uh, considered a great statesman, that has a very insidious effect. First, the two statements together mean that China is now competitor to America. The second step of that statement is that China will overtake America. So, it's the same thing. You know, if, if an Indian likes a toy, someone in Brazil would also like that toy. If Lee Kuan Yew says uh, something, people, uh, let's say in Johannesburg or uh, Paris or whatever, I would listen to his comment. If that wise man is saying this, there must be some truth in it. So China has already won one victory. And the same thing, he also made a comment when uh, President Xi was first sworn in in 2012. He said, watch this man. Now, just that comment, watch this man, means that this man is going to be something big. So, at a different level, you and I also need to watch our comments because if you praise, let's say, a Chinese good or a Chinese leader or a Chinese military power, that word spreads because the other person we are talking to will not think about it, will not analyze it, he will accept it because it is either coming from a great leader like Lee Kuan Yew or a friend like us or a person who seems to have read something about China. Even in our daily interaction, we need to be careful and for the fourth time, I'm talking about the FBI director when he says it needs a whole of society response. Unfortunately, we as a free world as a democratic world, are not thinking about that whole of society response. Well, I know you said that the 2020s, this decade, is uh, a window of opportunity for China. Why? Well, uh, number one, the world is not prepared for China. Number two, the world, the Western world, has got engaged in what is happening in Ukraine. So to free itself of that will take time. That is the first step. I mean, you can't have uh, all the American equipment. For example, uh, the, the new uh, defense chief of UK, uh, Britain, said when he took over a couple of weeks back that it will take us years to replenish the defense equipment that we have supplied to Ukraine. So that means UK is in a particularly vulnerable position till that replenishment is complete. Similarly, for other countries that have got engaged in Ukraine, it will mean that much less resources available. For example, uh, in, in case China decides to do something in the next uh, year or next two years or three years or whatever. So I do not know whether USA is making the same historical mistake as it did during Kissinger-Nixon time. That to take care of Soviet Union, they encouraged China now to take care of Russia, something which could perhaps have been uh, tackled diplomatically. It need not have exploded exploded in the way it has exploded. And President Biden need not have encouraged Russia, in fact, to nibble a little bit of Ukraine. But all that is history. Even now, if diplomacy can reduce the tensions or reduce the war, then the free world maybe or the Western world may be better prepared to face the challenge that is much greater. Well, speaking of this uh, this possible change, at the beginning of the podcast, we talked about how, you know, if there were a, a conflict on the Indian border, it would just be physically difficult for, say, the U.S. to get troops there. But later this year, uh, the U.S. and India are, are supposedly going to be holding joint exercises in the Himalayas. 
So is, I mean, does that sound like a step in the right direction? Well, that's certainly a step in the right direction. But where they are holding the exercises is at a lower altitude. It's not at those heights. Uh, getting to those heights, as I said, would need much more time for uh, any young person, uh, even fit soldiers, because they would need to get acclimatized to be able to uh, go and take part in something vigorous like fighting. Uh, but that apart, uh, no one is uh, at the moment imagining that American soldiers will actually fight there. But even if some equipment were to be sent, uh, it will take time to take it there, to assemble it, uh, and then to make it, uh, train the people. The same kind of uh, logistics uh, issues that you're finding in Ukraine, I mean, that was not automatic that Ukrainian soldiers were able to tackle the, the uh, sophisticated equipment. They had been training for years. For the last five to ten years, they had been training on Western equipment. Uh, and so when it finally was given to them, it was not as if they were strangers to the uh, thing. Uh, so uh, there, there are uh, difficulties. And just to uh, take this argument further to Taiwan, uh, you know, in my book, I've outlined this uh, scenario that supposing a war breaks out between China and Taiwan, it will not be easy for China because there is no land between China and Taiwan. So there will be logistics uh, issues. Uh, if you land troops there eventually, also you land uh, troops, they would need to be supplied with food, equipment, and so on, on a continuous basis. Something of a situation that Russia faced when it first tried to uh, go towards Kiev. Uh, so second, even if Chinese ships brought all the equipment and so on, uh, Taiwan has enough uh, resources to take care of at least some of the ships, and the damage could be quite substantial. The same applies to, let's say, once Chinese have landed in Taiwan and America or Japan or some other country decides to come in and help Taiwanese. If Chinese have already landed in Taiwan, then it becomes that much more difficult for a new armed force to step in because they'll face the same problems that Chinese had faced from Taiwanese initially. So war in today's world is not going to be uh, easy and not going to be predictable in its results. Uh, there could be many surprises, some of them very nasty for the country which started the war. And the same applies to uh, go back to your first question, to China in case it decides to, to launch a war against India. Because India has an experienced army, a motivated army, a battle-hardened army. Uh, and uh, it has some of the finest equipment uh, in the field. Plus, you know, the difference is everyone recognizes that India is a country. So <clears throat> there won't be as many questions about whether or not it's it's okay to support them, right? I mean, the U.S. can do joint military exercises with India now, but the U.S. politically finds it hard to do the same thing with Taiwan. Diplomacy uh, is a strange creature. Uh, it finds uh, different ways of approaching the same issue. Uh, so Taiwan, for example, uh, was the original China till China was given the membership in the United Nations of the seat occupied by Taiwan. Similarly, it was only in the 70s that America shifted its position and started uh, talking in terms of one China policy. So before that, uh, American position on Taiwan was different and so was that of many other countries in the world. So what happens in future with regard to Taiwan, uh, only time will tell. But uh, another thought I would leave with you, uh, I'm sure all three of you are greater experts. 
Uh, but the fact is that Taiwan was not inhabited by Chinese people originally. So it was only in recent uh, decades and centuries uh, that Chinese migration took place. And in fact, for quite some time, Japan had occupied Taiwan. Uh, and it was only after, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, around the Second World War or so, that Japan relinquished its uh, uh, hold over uh, Taiwan uh, to China. Uh, so these claims are nebulous, uh, but China is assertive in its claims and it uh, interprets history as it suits it. Otherwise, if it was uh, more conscious of history and other countries' claims, it would not have had territorial disputes with 17 countries uh, of the world, uh, either sea-based or land-based disputes. And it would have been more respectful, re respectful of uh, the international law. For example, as you know very well, the UN arbitration panel had ruled in favor of Philippines over the islands. And China said, no, we don't recognize the UN uh, panel's uh, authority. So wherever it suits China, uh, rules come in. Wherever it suits China, it invents history. Wherever it suits China, it makes claims which are, uh, you know, doubtful legally. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing this information. For, for the audience, why don't you tell them a bit more about your book and where they can buy it? Well, thank you so much. Uh, uh, you know, Amazon.com in America now has both the hardcover and the Kindle version of the book. And I think uh, the way I have uh, tackled the issue, uh, wartime, the world in danger, is a message which would resonate, which would appeal to uh, your viewers uh, because it is an entire approach for where the world is heading, not just in terms of war, but in terms of, for example, uh, artificial intelligence, in terms of uh, uh, the, the geo strategy, in terms of people's behavior, in terms of multiculturalism, in terms of human rights, in terms of scientific advances, in terms of what would happen in case of a nuclear war and whether nuclear war could happen. So all these are issues which I have tried to explain in as easy to understand language as possible. And it has already become a bestseller in India, commented upon very favorably by all the reviews it has got so far. So I hope uh, it gets uh, the same readership in America. And it is, uh, I believe, easily available on Amazon.com. Thank you. So everyone likes your book except the Chinese Communist Party. Well, I hope they, they read it because maybe they might change their habits and views and uh, their worldview. Well, congratulations on the success of your book. And again, thank you for joining us. Uh, and yeah, for anyone watching... There's, there's loads of stuff we didn't even get a chance to get into that's in the book, especially like we didn't have a chance to even talk about Pakistan and China and India, which is a huge thing. So once again, thank you for joining us. And, and I do recommend the book. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure being with all of you. And I've enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. All the best to you. Yeah, after, after talking to him, it is it is like FBI Director Christopher Wray, I believe is who he was talking about, said that this needs to be a whole of society approach to countering the Chinese Communist Party. And I think I think we really do need to get back to the 40s and 50s and like talk about the communists. Like seriously, like I think a lot of people do know, hey, communists, communism isn't good. Let's say it like it is. You know, like uh, this communist know. regime. No, I, I think I actually, it hasn't been tried, Chris. Real communism has not been tried. And what was your point, Shelley? Well, I was going to say, I think there's a danger there, which is like bringing up McCarthyism and that kind of thing again. 
And then the other thing is that I don't think that a lot of young people think that communism is bad. Oh, I don't. Way. Depends on what corners of the internet you go on. Oh, gosh. Well, okay. Maybe I'm not on those corners of the internet. But I think mm. that, like, there is generally... I mean, we didn't really learn about communism when I was in school. Like, the entire... Because of the long march through the institutions. Well, I mean, I, I really don't think that you know, the high school in suburban Pittsburgh that I went to was infiltrated by communists. I think it was just that we had, you know, we spent too much time talking about the Civil War and never got to the 20th century. Civil War. Um, I don't know. I I think there is something to it. I mean, being able to label these things in a way that people can understand is important. And yeah, I mean, the idea that like, you know, hey, this is, you know, a communist run social media app. Is that really what you want? I don't think that's going to work. <laughs> like, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm curious what the audience thinks. This about might that. be Would a little be... bit of a selective, uh, you know, it's not going to be a general. You so know. It's, it's everything is done bit by bit. No, no, no. I'm just saying that like the comments will not be a reflection of what the general population thinks or knows about. Comments. We are the seeds of a new and better tomorrow. I do think that people need to be educated about what communism has done in the world, but I just think that using it as a kind of pejorative is not going to be helpful. People need people... names and labels. You know who understands that? Communists. <laughs> That's true. But Label I just them think... counter-revolutionaries, blah, 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 blah. But I think that without the understanding of like the history of it then it just sounds like you're calling somebody like a nazi but less effectively do you know what i mean because like i think the word nazi on the internet has means almost nothing now because it's been just used as a pejorative so let's make communist mean something again so i think the way to do that is with educating people not just yeah you educate them about communists yeah well I i think it's just like just using it as a way to mean something negative will end up being like what what is that law godwin law about how every internet that's something about a cat no that's the that's the thing about how every internet argument devolves into people calling each other hitler hey if it became people calling each other communists i would be very happy and amused i feel like i give up I, yeah that's exactly the opposite <laughs> of the this, argument this Shelley is was making. how it works you just keep yelling communists until people like you just give up. And then yeah. you're the only one talking loudly. <laughs> that no one is convinced by. <laughs> Doesn't matter. They've all been given up and crushed by the relentless red wave. Did I say I missed Chris last week? Yeah, I believe you had <laughs> erroneously said that. <laughs> Thanks for watching China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley John. And I'm Matt Ganesta. We'll talk to you next time as we fight the communists. And their filthy communism. Thanks, Chris. I hate this. <laughs>